The third thing that is quite often underestimated is sadism. A little less cheerful, this part. Just as we're trained to find some so-called rational explanation for altruism, we are solidly in the habit of seeking out sensible motivations behind actions driven by irrational urges, especially evil ones. When someone claims he cannot possibly end the policy of separating children from parents and then does so, our inclination is to assume that at least he's being honest with himself, that somewhere there is a secret explanation that makes sense and it's just not being shared with us. But locking up little children at a greater cost than what it would cost to place them and their families in luxury hotels or top boarding schools or hospitals or job training programs and instead depriving them of basic needs doesn't scream out for a rational explanation. The US practice of mass incarceration of refugees and of non-refugees makes zero financial and zero public policy sense. It doesn't reduce crime in the way that a smaller expense put into education and health would. It's not designed around protecting the public as most of the people locked up are no particular threat and many of them never were. You can call it correctional, but it's not designed to correct anything. Incarceration and the torture of solitary confinement and the horror of state execution are, however, often openly justified as vengeance, meaning that the point is not forward-looking at all, but backward. The point is cruelty towards someone being blamed for something, just as I have seen on social media people blaming the victims of this separation policy for their own hardships. Why do some people scream for environmental destruction, yell, drill, baby, drill, spend the money for the biggest gas-guzzling vehicles possible, or hunt the biggest animals possible? It isn't all profit motive. Most people don't own oil companies. It isn't all ignorance or denial. People may pretend that the earth isn't dying, or that the livestock industry isn't a big part of what's killing it, or that the animals grown for human consumption don't suffer, but other people, and often the very same people, take glee in the creation of suffering. That we are engaged in a mass suicide taking many other species with us is not all an accident, not all a tragedy of the commons. In fact, there's no such thing as a tragedy of the commons. There is a tragedy of privatization. I wrote a book called War is a Lie in which I examined various types of lies used to initiate or extend wars and then tried to also answer what really motivates the wars for which the lies have been told. I found that I just couldn't explain all wars with profit motives or political calculation or even misguided national defense. I found that I needed the mad drive toward domination and the willful cruelty of pointless destruction to explain war. When U.S. war planners would privately discuss extending the war on Vietnam, they would consider what reasons to give the public, and they would separately discuss what reasons to give each other. But they would never discuss whether or not to extend the war. That was simply understood. The Pentagon Papers analysis put percentages on motivations, including 70% for the motivation being that of saving face, continuing the war purely so as not to end it. That seems mad enough, but where in that analysis was the motivation of sadism? This was a war full of massacres of innocents, their ears collected as trophies, with war supporters back home screaming for racist killing. In recent wars, you can, as a fraction of the U.S. Pop population does, claim to be supporting the destruction of Iraq or Libya as an act of philanthropy for the benefit of its victims. But you will find yourself on the same side of the issue with those shouting for blood and urging the use of nuclear weapons. Participants in these wars painfully catch on to what they've been engaged in. Some of them can't handle the realization. Some of them become dedicated whistleblowers. And yet others publicly proclaim the great service they've rendered and appreciate being thanked for it. And we're supposed to think ourselves cruel if we don't offer up our gratitude, including to those who've supposedly given their lives. No matter how courageously or misguidedly they've acted, I say their lives were not given but taken from them by the monstrous urges of those in power who pursue pointless counterproductive policies while chanting there is no military solution, there is no military solution, and knowing perfectly well that those words are true. 
When George W. Bush proposed painting a plane with UN colors and flying it low to try to get it shot at so as to start a war that he said God had instructed him to wage and which was needed because Saddam Hussein had supposedly tried to kill his daddy. Or when Lyndon Johnson gloated, I didn't just screw Ho Chi Minh, I cut his pecker off. Forgive me. Or when Bill Clinton remarked about Somalis and Feel free to sue Bill Clinton, but this is what he said. We're not inflicting pain on these fuckers. I can't believe we're being pushed around by these two-bit pricks. Or when New York Times columnist Tom Friedman said the purpose of the Iraq war was to kick indoors and declare suck on this. Or when people have sent me death threats for advocating peace. Or when Barack Obama announced immunity for crimes through a policy of looking forward but rolled out a new sort of war using flying robots targeting small numbers of people, the majority of them never identified. In these and countless other cases, what we're dealing with is not sanity, not logic, and not tough love. What we're dealing with is cruelty run amok. What else could one call the idea of building smaller, more supposedly usable nuclear weapons? meaning nukes roughly the strength of those dropped on Japan, and knowing full well that an exchange of nuclear weapons could black out the sun and starve us. Attempts to rationalize Harry Truman's approval of nuking Hiroshima and Nagasaki, rather than following the advice of his top generals who opposed it, rather than listening to the top strategists who said it wasn't needed, rather than demonstrating a nuclear weapon on an unpopulated area and threatening to use it on people, rather than allowing one, rather than two, nukings to suffice. These attempts fall short. Truman was the same man who had said that if the Germans were winning, we should help the Russians, and if the Russians are winning, we should help the Nazis, because that way more people will die. The notion that he saw maximizing Japanese deaths as a downside of any decision is not supported by any evidence. U.S. support for multiple sides in wars like the Iran-Iraq war of the 1980s or the current war in Syria is not purely incompetence. Like much of public policy, like arresting homeless people in San Diego for being homeless rather than giving them homes, we can better understand what we're dealing with if we admit to each other that we're dealing with sadism. This doesn't mean that wars don't also have lots of more rational motivations, and it doesn't mean that all war supporters are drooling lunatics. I've done civil public debates with war supporters and found through polling the room before and after the debates that such ras rational discussion changes minds. The lesson that everyone has learned about believers in WMDs holding their beliefs more firmly after being presented with facts should not be overblown. Persuading people of what they'd rather not know is difficult, but not impossible. But for many supporters of wars, some factors are not fact-based, thoughtful considerations. A preacher in Alabama wants any football player who doesn't properly worship the US flag and national anthem to be killed. President Trump merely wants them fired. He also claims that anyone who cares about refugee families must hate the victims of any murders committed by refugees, while presumably caring compassionately for the victims of any murders committed by non-refugees. Sadism and patriotism and exceptionalism mesh very nicely together, and none of them makes any sense. There is no particular reason that people should identify with other people at the level of a nation more so than at the level of a family or a neighborhood or a city or a state or a continent or a planet. Belief in national exceptionalism, in US superiority to other places is, and this is the topic of my new book, Curing Exceptionalism, no more fact-based and no less harmful than racism, sexism, or other sorts of bigotry. While poor white people could for centuries proclaim, at least I'm better than non-white people, Anyone in the United States can claim, at least I'm better than non-Americans. And anyone can try to believe that, but it doesn't make sense, and it does do great damage. In Curing Exceptionalism, I review many ways in which the United States might be the greatest nation on Earth, and I'm unable to find any. It's not, by anybody's measure, most free or democratic or richest 
or most prosperous or best educated or healthiest or holding the longest life expectancy or the greatest happiness or the most environmental sustainability or anything else that one might want to use to provide substance to chance of we're number one. The United States is number one in locking people in cages, in military spending, in various measures of environmental destruction, and other sources of shame rather than pride. But basically, it is a worse place to live by most quantifiable measurements than any other wealthy country, while still being a better place to live than a poor country, or a country where the CIA is assisting a coup, or a country being endlessly liberated by NATO. The fact that people try to immigrate to the United States is not actually evidence of greatest nation on earth status. The United States is not the most preferred destination, does not accept the most immigrants, is not the kindest to immigrants when they arrive, and does not shape its immigration policies around aiding those most in need, but rather around preferences for Europeans. The fact that people need to escape danger and poverty in poor nations is just not relevant to the question of whether the United States can bring itself up to the standards of other wealthy nations. Or it's only relevant in the sense that by redirecting priorities to human and environmental needs at home and abroad, the US government could catch up to the rich countries while ceasing to contribute to the suffering of many poor countries, and in fact help many uh, and in fact help to make many countries places where people prefer to remain. Do we need a slightly less cruel immigration policy and a larger wall? Or do we need open borders that will allow in billions of people? Neither. We need open borders combined with unimaginably enormous efforts to make people's own countries desirable places to live and a halt to policies that help make them unlivable. And this we can do. <laughs> and this we can do with a redirection of a fraction of military spending. But people in Excuse me, but people in the United States view the United States as exceptionally great. Their patriotism, their belief in unique superiority, the prevalence of flags and national anthems outpaces those in other countries. Even the poor in the United States who have it worse than the poor in other wealthy countries are more patriotic than the poor in other countries or than the wealthy in their own country. The damage this does takes many forms. It distracts people from organizing and acting for change. It leads people to support politicians, not because they will do them any good, but because they are patriotic. The least likely person to be elected US president is not actually an atheist. It is a non-patriot. Exceptionalism leads people to support wars and to oppose international cooperation and law. It leads people to reject proven solutions to gun control, health care, education, because they've been proven in other countries that ought to learn from this one rather than the other way around. It leads to indifference to United Nations reports on the cruelty of poverty in the United States. It leads to the rejection of foreign aid following so-called natural disasters in the United States. We need to come around to understanding that patriotism, nationalism, exceptionalism is not something to be done properly but a nightmare from which to awaken. Peace is not patriotic, peace is globalist. Peace depends on our identifying as humans rather than as Americans. This does not mean feeling national shame instead of national pride. It does not mean identifying with some other nation. It means diminishing one's identification with nationalism in order to identify as an individual, as a member of various communities, as a global citizen, as part of a fragile ecosystem. When the US government raises your taxes or claims the right to part of your land or bails out Wall Street or expands the rights of corporations or any of the other things it does so wonderfully, people don't tend to place those actions in the first person. Very few people say, we just gerrymandered the districts, or we gave more war weapons to local police departments, or we take in billions in campaign contributions. Instead, people talk about the government using, imagine this, using the word government. They say, the government raised my taxes, 
or the state government made voter registration automatic, or the local government built a park. But when it comes to war, even peace activists, even peace activists sitting in jail for peace at the time, announced that we just bombed another country. That identification needs to end. We need to remember and increase our awareness of our responsibility to change things. But we don't need to make our identity into one that looks better to us if we imagine the Pentagon must have some good reason for helping to starve the people of Yemen. In curing exceptionalism, I look at various techniques for curing exceptionalism, including role reversal. Let me just quote one paragraph. Let's imagine that for whatever reasons, beginning some 70 years ago, North Korea drew a line through the United States. Let me say a couple of drunk colonels late at night drew a line, I'm trying to be accurate here, drew a line through the United States and destroyed 80% of the cities in the North United States and killed millions of North USians. Then North Korea refused to allow any US reunification or official end to the war, maintained wartime control of the South United States military, built major North Korean military bases in the South United States, placed missiles just south of the US demilitarized zone that ran through the middle of the country, and imposed brutal economic sanctions on the North United States for decades. As a resident of the North United States, what might you think when the president of North Korea threatened your country with fire and fury? Your own government might have gazillions of current and historical crimes and shortcomings to its credit. But what would you think of threats coming from the country that killed your grandparents and walled you off from your cousins? Or would you be too scared to think rationally? This sort of experiment is possible in hundreds of variations and I recommend trying it repeatedly in your own mind and in groups so that people's creativity can feed into the imagination of others. What is my point in suggesting that we underestimate military spending, altruism, and sadism? Well, mainly it is to come up with an accurate understanding and then we can try to draw lessons for how to act. One lesson might be this. In undoing sadism, we need interventions that recognize the possibility of altruism. Members of the Ku Klux Klan have been converted into advocates for racial justice. People have joined across racial lines for economic justice in poor people's campaigns, old and new. Those who identify with imagined U.S. greatness often fantasize about levels of U.S. generosity and goodness, which, if made real, would transform the world for the better. Learning a little bit about another culture or language is not hard and may not meet as much resistance as a peace demonstration, but can make all the difference. Studies have found that willingness to bomb a country is inversely proportional to the ability to accurately locate that country on a map. <laughs> what if super patriots could somehow be tricked into learning the geography of the globe that they seek to rule? And ultimately, what would happen if people could be made aware of the size of the US military budget and the fact that it reduces jobs rather than creating them, endangers Americans rather than protecting them, destroys the natural environment rather than preserving it, erodes liberties rather than creating freedom, shortens our lives, reduces our health, and threatens our security? What if those who want the United States to be generous could join forces with those who pretend it is generous and act on the basis of facts to make it into the sort of government that not only doesn't remove children from their living parents, but also doesn't create millions of orphans by killing their parents with wars. People do care about cruelty when they find out about it. But cruelty in foreign policy is the least found out about because no major political party wants it known, because the corporate media wants it unknown, because school boards consider such knowledge treasonous, and because people do not want to know. George Orwell said that a nationalist will not just excuse atrocities committed by his or her nation, but they will show a remarkable ability never to find out about them. Yet we know that if people could be compelled to find out about them, they would care. And if they found out about them through a communication system that made them aware that others were finding out about them too, they would act. As things stand with our very limited awareness, we are not powerless. Preventing the 2013 bombing of Syria, 
upholding for a few years the 2015 Iran agreement, and by the way, preventing a concerted effort in Washington to start a war on Iran several times over the past decades, halting the threats of fire and fury, stopping the removal of children from families, at least for the moment, we hope. These are all partial victories that point to far greater potential. I've written a children's book called Tube World that tries to give children a non-exceptionalist, kind, and constructive perspective on things. I've also written and brought with me today a book called War is Never Just, which I wrote in preparation for a debate, and which is a critique of so-called just war theory. In it, I make a case that many criteria of just war theory can never be met, but that if they could be met, then a miraculous just war would still, in order to be morally justified, need to outweigh the damage done by keeping the institution of war around and dumping a trillion dollars a year into it. Such a feat is impossible. Given the alternatives that we have developed in nonviolent action, unarmed peacekeeping, truth and reconciliation, diplomacy, aid, and the rule of law, this perspective of taking on the entire institution of war is that of an organization I work for called World Beyond War. We have a very short pledge that people have signed thus far in 158 countries, and which I'll pass around on a clipboard in just a moment in case you'd like to sign it too, and put down your email address if you'd like to be more involved, and put it down really super legibly if you'd like us to not accidentally email somebody else. <laughs> I, I will read you the pledge so you don't have to read it off the clipboard. I understand that wars and militarism make us less safe rather than protect us, that they kill, injure, and traumatize adults, children, and infants, severely damage the natural environment, erode civil liberties, and drain our economies, siphoning resources from life-affirming activities. I commit to engage in and support nonviolent efforts to end all war and preparations for war and to create a sustainable and just peace. The end. We work at World Beyond War, we work on educational and activist efforts to advance this goal and steps in its direction. We seek the closure of bases, divestment from weapons, accountability for crimes, shifts in budgets, etc. And sometimes we plan big days of actions. One that is coming up on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, exactly 100 years since the ending of World War I, and I know Vets for Peace, among other groups in the room, is working on this too, is Armistice Day, which was a holiday for peace up until its conversion into Veterans Day during the destruction of North Korea in the 1950s. Now it is a holiday on which Veterans for Peace groups in various cities are forbidden to participate in parades. We need to turn it back into Armistice Day. And in particular, we need to overwhelm with our celebration of Armistice Day, the celebration of weaponry, of war, and the implicit threat to the world that Donald Trump has planned for this day in Washington, D.C. Go to worldbeyondwar.org slash Armistice Day to learn more. I would love to uh, welcome any questions and discussions. Thank you very much.